Welcome to a special virtual edition of the Skeptics Track at DragonCon, where we put the science in science fiction. Welcome back to DragonCon Virtual. This is Skeptic Track, and today I'm going to talk to Bernie, who talks a lot in his book about ancient heroes. So Bernie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Derek, first, thanks for having me on DragonCon Skeptic Program. It's a great pleasure to be here. And today we're going to talk about where do the heroes come from? Not just the heroes, but the monsters and ghosts as well. And we're going to take you back tens of thousands of years deep into the Paleolithic. And we're going to look at the Paleolithic art and find the characters that the ancient Greeks borrowed and we still carry in our comics to today. The coolest part about your book that I read shows some of this, when I say ancient, we're talking about like the Greeks would have been thought these guys were ancient. So the, your work goes way back to like the beginning of men exploring artwork, pretty much, right? That's right. We're going to go to the earliest artwork of mankind. We're going to go deep into the depths of the human imagination. We're going to explore all these great questions that we've asked about ourselves, but we've been unable to answer without looking at this cave art. So in your presentation that people are about to see, um, my favorite stuff is going to be how you saw some of this artwork that people had never seen for, before in these caves that were kind of telling the story of monsters and heroes long before the ancient Greeks took, you know, memorized poetry and passed it down. So this is actually part of humanity from a long time ago. Absolutely, Derek. Now, I'm not the first to have seen these, but in fact, the ancient Greeks had seen these. They had been to these caves because we they left the tourist trash. And they looked at the images and they walked away and they created their own myths. They recognized heroic characters. They, they recognized the villains and they recognized the monsters, the monsters within themselves. And they create these fabulous myths um, as told in the labors of Hercules and Odysseus and the great works of Homer. These are the stories that are within us all that the ancient Greeks retold. So I'm not the first to see these, but I'm the first one to bring it to the modern eye. Yeah, so I assume, because you know, everybody knows that there's only a certain number of plots and heroic tales that we know about did any of these ancient people ever come up with a different one that we didn't know of before? Or is this like a standard thing in humanity? Well, the characters remain the same. We have heroes. We have villains. And that's what we have in normal, in everyday life. You, know, you, you walk into the mall and you see someone snatch a purse. You then decide if you're going to be the hero. We know who the villain is, the purse snatcher. And we know who the damsel or the man in distress is, could be. So we, we have these, these archetypal characters within us. The question is, did the ancient Greeks have the same interpretation as the Pelican Cave artists that put these characters on the panel? So we're, we, in the presentation, we're going to find that there's overlapping of human and animals. So human overlapping with an animal becomes a centaur. Is that a monster or is it a hero gaining strength from the horse on his journey? Two interpretations of the same character. So cool. So before we let you do your presentation, tell people a little bit about your background. How did you come about this? I mean, how did you get involved with this kind of work? I completely fell into it. I was interested in biological clocks and rhythms in nature. And that's why I approached the cave art. I wrote a previous book, Biological Time. I was interested in how do animals time themselves? How, how do the salmon know when to migrate at the same time? They all don't smart follow one smart salmon. And the same with geese. Geese go on migrations together. So I was concerned with that question because it's a big, it's a big issue in, um, in wildlife conservation. So I approached it. I worked with fishery biologists and, and wildlife professionals, and I wrote biological time, gave presentations to the, the tribes, the um, federal agencies, and so on. And then someone said to me, well, what if Native Americans have this. And if Native Americans have these traditions, because I actually showed that they did, 
And why couldn't it be deeper into the Paleolithic? Why couldn't cavemen have the same methodology of knowing when the salmon would arrive, when the deer would rut? Because they needed that information for their own survival and prosperity, just like the Native Americans. So I looked at the Paleolithic caves of Europe and I found that the same traditions that are in the biological clocks of these animals and as expressed in the calendars and hunting and gathering methodologies of Native Americans were in fact on these cave walls. And that's how I approached it before Orion. But then I started to see something different, something beyond the biological clocks and the rhythms and natures and the calendars. I recognized that these are characters on these panels that we know, that every grade school kid knows, and every middle school kid can tell the story. And Disney has captured every one of these ca characters in their sequence of movies. And so I stepped away from the biological clocks and the rhythms of nature and even the Native American traditions. And I started to ask the question, where does this come from? And how do we know this? And how can we still recognize these characters and stories today? Which of course brought me to Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung. Exactly, very cool. Well, I'm gonna let you do your presentation. And uh, I, hopefully now that people got excited about it, cause I'm sorry, but we were talking about things that are so long ago, but yet they, the common thread still goes on to today when you actually go to the movie, can go to a movie theater, unlike we can right now. So <laughs> we can do it from home with Netflix, I guess. Uh, but currently, you have to watch movies at home. But we still do, uh, we still flock to these stories that you found on cave art that is long before any written history that we know of. Uh, so we consider like writing so it's pretty cool so we're gonna let you do your presentation and uh, hopefully we can uh, have a bit of a talk afterwards that'd be great Derek heroes monsters and ghosts with Bernie Taylor did we invent them those heroes monsters and ghosts or are they inherited from the ancient world. Perhaps even deeper in time, in the Paleolithic caves of Europe. That's where we would travel today, to the Iberian Peninsula, to the northern part in a region called Cantabria, as marked by the X. To a place called Monte Castillo, in the El Castillo cave, where we find the gallery of discs made about 34,000 years ago. The panel is 10 meters long, and each disc is on average about the size of the palm of your hand. There are 90 discs in all. What do you see when you look into the panel? How many discs do you count? That was my approach when I first started looking at this gallery of discs. I was counting the red dots. And what I had missed at first was this elephant in the room. This elephant with its trunk and ears up. Its eye has an uneasy look. Soon after, I looked back at the image and I started to think, what else could be there? Could there be other animals? Could there be people? That's the elephant in the room. Can you see the elephant in the room? Perhaps there's more elephants. Here we find an elephant with its ear back and its trunk down. But this is in fact the same elephant. If you rotate your head 90 degrees, you'll see that they're made from the same trunk and ear. One is in distress with his trunk up and the other drinking. Perhaps this is a story. Perhaps that's an early sort of animation showing two characters or one character in motion in the same scene. 
I believe that this was a story told by this teacher to his apprentice on this gallery of discs. The apprentice has wide red eyes. You can see his mouth is pursed. The teacher with his large nose is speaking to the ear of the apprentice. You can see his brownish black hairline. He's much older than the boy. Was it really a hairline? Perhaps it's this fledgling golden eagle that sits on his shoulder. The eagle is about a foot high and has the down on its flanks, indicating that it hasn't flown yet. This would be a mid to late June time period in this part of Spain. We also find this masked cosmic man. His right hand holds an object, looks like an egg. His left hand is against the wall. His left knee is raised and his leg drops down. Where his right leg is, is uncertain. And I believe that's part of the story. If we look up at his head or the mask over his face, we see an eye on one side, on his left, and on his right, you see the beak of an eagle. This cosmic man has taken on the mask or persona of an eagle. The image is reminiscent of the Norse Odin, who gives up an eye to see. Odin would send his birds around the world to tell him what was happening, whereas this Paleolithic cosmic man himself turned into an eagle so that he could see beyond, and he gave up an eye to see. We see the cosmic man a little closer. You can see his teeth hanging down. You can see his bluish gray eye. And on the other side, we can compare to the teacher. If you turn the teacher 90 degrees, it becomes the mask of the cosmic man. And the beak on the mask of the cosmic man is the juvenile eagle that stands on the shoulder of the teacher. The theoretical physicist David Baum said something that the Paleolithic cave artists would have understood. The ability to perceive or think differently is more important than the knowledge gained. On this panel, we also find the speckled mare. The speckled mare appears to be leaping. The breed looks very much like Przolski's horse with the raised mane and the doggish sort of face. The mare is in front of our cosmic man, becoming the cosmic rider. The two become one. So our hero on his journey encounters the eagle, takes on the strength of the eagle. The hero then encounters the horse and takes on the strength of the horse. The image is reminiscent of the Greek centaur, the half man, half horse. It's a sort of transformation that we also find in this panel of this character who takes his mask on and off. And again, he appears to be holding something in his right hand. Note the left hand that reaches behind his back. That left hand is the same left hand of the cosmic man that stands against the wall. On this panel, we also find a mother Iberian lynx and her kitten. You can see the kitten push up against her ruff. This is about a mid to late June time period on the Iberian Peninsula. We also find the now extinct great auk, a marine bird that's not a penguin, but has some similar characteristics. We find a crab down by the shoreline. 
so we're near a marine environment. And then we find this monk seal lounging on the rocks. And then a breaching humpback whale. This is all on the same panel. These characters are overlapping with each other. It's an extraordinary image. We find the spinning bottlenose dolphin, or it's multiple dolphins, behind each other. And a therianthrope. Earlier, we saw the man with the egg and his arm behind his back. He overlaps with the dolphin to become a merman. Or a female would be the mermaid. This is, of course, reinvented with Aquaman, who takes on the abilities of a fish or marine mammal to give him his strength. This is a very old tradition. And there's a journey. There's a journey of the apprentice who's in the belly of the whale. You can see him in that lightened area. The image is reminiscent of Jonah and the whale in the Abrahamic tradition. There's a hero who's lifted by a spinning nose dolphin, that dolphin that we saw earlier. And around his neck, he has a pelt of red dots and he holds a club. But I think we're getting ahead of ourselves with the red pelt because he hasn't always worn it. And perhaps when he was in the marine environment, he didn't have that pelt on. He was otherwise naked when lifted by the dolphin. Next to the man with the club, we find the spitchest dog. The key characteristics are the fox's face and the tail that flips on its back. Spitz dogs date in the DNA to more than 30,000 years ago and are among our earliest dogs. We also find this effigy, the oldest female effigy to date. She doesn't look happy. She looks in distress. She has long braided hair, which is captured by the red discs. And these giraffes, two of them, the juvenile who puts its neck and head around the back of the mother, they appear to be sleeping, or at least the mother is protecting the juvenile. The molted red pattern for the giraffe is created by the red discs. And this Barbary ape, When we count the Barbary ape and the giraffe, we recognize that we're in Africa. There are Barbary apes today in Gibraltar, but they're not indigenous to the Iberian Peninsula. Our hero has traveled down south of the Iberian Peninsula. He's crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and he's now in Western North Africa. The Barbary ape is indigenous to the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. And here we encounter two lions, the lioness who's licking the lion. Notice four paws, they overlap with each other and there's red spots on those paws. It's an incredible scene. It's a huge lion. Remember this panel is 10 meters across that's a big lion. Our lion overlaps with the hero of the club, who appears to be having a bad day. We can see the lion pawing our hero. The image echoes Hercules and the Nimian lion 
from the labors of Hercules. And in that myth, Hercules goes into a deep cave where he encounters the Nimi lion who has red spots on him from the blood of his previous human victims. And of course, Hercules kills the lion and takes his pelt, as does our hero on the gallery of discs. Hercules, in his labors, goes on to wear the Nimean lion pelt, which protects him from arrows and spears and sharp objects. We also find a mother bear and her cubs. The mother appears to be watching the juveniles climb, perhaps a tree. And we see this ostrich with its long neck and pointed toes. If you cut off the legs of an ostrich, which I don't recommend that you do, this would look like a swan. Remember that. We're gonna to return to that later on. In that same space, we find a swimmer. His head is bobbing up and down. His left arm is up as if he's pulling back water in a crawl. His feet are flutter kicking and his two and his right arm is down, pulling back water. He overlaps with another version of the elephant who has two ears and his trunk out as if in the water. And in that same space, we find a crocodile. That's a big crocodile. Remember, this is a 10 meter panel. So that crocodile is about 15 meters long. Our swimmer overlaps with the crocodile. He appears being thrashed by the crocodile. He's having a rough day. We can start to look at these pieces together, all these characters, the animals and the people. And we can see them in the night sky starting from the north where we found the cosmic man with his mask that is the constellation hercules and as we move south b is agala the eagle who overlaps with the cosmic man who gives him strength to fly c is the reptile constellation the lizard d is pegasus the winged horse who gains that strength from the eagle and who overlaps with the cosmic man to become a centaur. E is Pisces. And I believe Pisces is the dolphin going in one direction and the whale going in another. So on this hero's journey, when he went south, he followed or drew strength from the dolphin. And when he came back north, he was helped by the whale. F is Cetus, who we found as the monk seal, but the ancient Greeks thought of him as a monster, a sea monster. G is Perseus, our strong swimmer. H is Aruga, the head of the elephant, and I, Taurus, is his trunk or her trunk. J is the lynx or perhaps the tail of the lynx. K is Cygnus the swan, which I believe is either the great auk or the ostrich. Remember, if you chop off the legs of an ostrich, it looks like a swan. L is Draco, the dragon, and perhaps our first image and origin of the dragon myth. M is Ursa Major, the mother bear. And I believe that the space between the Ursa Major's legs are the juvenile bears. N is Leo the lion. O is Gemini, the Barbary ape, whose eyes are the stars Castor and Pollux. 
P is our hero, Orion, who holds the club. And next to Orion is Q, the, the dog, the Spitz dog, and the star Cirrus. The night sky is a mirror to the terrestrial world. So as our hero travels from the north to the south and back again, he not only follows the stars of the night sky, but he follows the animals in his environments. And this tells us, of course, where dragons come from, which is what everybody at Dragon Con wants to know, right? This is the scene of St. George, the Dragon Slayer. That's a better dragon, though. A lot more interesting. But it's more about dragons. It's about a hero on a journey. But it's one hero on this journey that we see. All these characters are different constellations who represent the same hero. So our Hercules as our cosmic man, our strong swimmer as Perseus, Orion with the club, they're all, and the apprentice, they're all the same character on his journey. And on this journey, he comes to face himself and he battles with himself, perhaps an early understanding of psychology. And he's battling himself at a different point in time, a time in his past. On this journey that he takes all the way from the north of what is now Spain on the Iberian Peninsula to Morocco and back. And as he crosses the, the Strait of Gibraltar, he is in fact in the sea. That is not just the, the marine sea, but it's the sea among the constellations where we find the aquatic animals. Where we found Cetus and where we found the damsel in distress, who would be the constellation Andromeda of Greek myth. And per, of course, Perseus slays Cetus to save Andromeda, the woman in distress by the rocks. And that could be our strong swimmer. It could be Orion character. They're all the same hero. Our Aquaman, our merman, is in the place of Aquarius, the water barrier in that same astronomical and marine sea. The overlapping of the man and the horse becomes Sagittarius. Constellations that the Greeks recognized as given to us by Claudius Ptolemy, who's considered the greatest astronomer of antiquity. But they were astronomers among the ancient Greeks before Ptolemy. And I believe that some of these constellations were handed down to Ptolemy. Astronomers such as Hipparchus and Eudoxus. Eudoxus visited Egypt and he learned astronomy from the ancient priests. We can find many of these constellations in the Greek record. And that's the first time we do find them after the Peleth of Cave Panel. So perhaps the ancient Greeks or the Egyptians and others had been to these caves and they had found these images in the night sky. Ptolemy was a very good librarian. He was in fact the chief librarian at the Great Library of Alexandria, which burned down a few times. And how they commandeered books was they would tell all the ships that came into harbor that they had to hand over their books to be copied. And the Library of Alexandria would give back the copy and keep the original. And they built quite a collection. Few, if any, of these documents exist today. It would have been a library with stories, stories that the teacher and apprentice told, told, a library about the marine and terrestrial world, a library about all these animals that people encountered on their journey, as we found on this panel and in the night sky. Joseph Campbell said, they're all the same hero. The sets change, the costumes change, but it's fundamentally the same story of a hero on his journey. 
And I believe that first hero is deeper than 34,000 years ago because one doesn't first start marking, engraving their story into the walls of caves. They tell them in the night sky, around campfires. And of course, we know Joseph Campbell by his influence on George Lucas, who drew a lot of his metaphors and story structure for the Star Wars movies. And we find the hero at the top of the heap, holding his weapon, and below him is the sort of damsel in distress in the, in the case of Leah, but definitely so for Andromeda, as the Greeks saw her on the gallery of discs. Star Wars not only has these images, these metaphorical archetypal characters, but also the overlapping of the characters, the cubism of the poetic art. And there have been many heroes over time, and there have been many more into the future. And they change from male to female, depending on social constructs. Of course, Moana is a great hero who traveled around the Pacific by the stars on her own hero's journey. And then we have St. George who slays the dragon and Luke, um, Hercules, the characters in Journey to the West, Frodo and Perseus who, who cuts off the head of Medusa. Perhaps there's a hero within us all waiting to come forth by our own, uh, own actions and a hidden monster as well, when we look in the mirror, when we put on the mask. Those many masks we wear at Dragon Con and in our real worlds, the monsters and the heroes that are within us all. Some say it's just a part of it We've got to fulfill the book as left to us by the immortal Bob Marley. What books do you read and live by? What stories do you tell? That is the essence of these pale of the cave panels, the hero's journey, the myths of the ancient Greeks, and all of us who are participating in Dragon Con. More in my work can be found on my webpage, beforeorion.com, and across social media platforms. I use Before Orion for everything. Join me on the journey and enjoy this year's Virtual Dragon Con Conference. So, Bernie, that was basically a really good, tight summary of what I read in your book. Um, so, one question that I know everybody out there probably has, not everybody, but enough people. Um, so what is the difference between the pareidolia that many people have and what you've discovered? So how is what you found not just, oh, it's just a stain in the rock or, you know, somebody was working on a, a piece of leather there and just happens to look like a minotaur? So... Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Derek, that's a very good skeptic question. <laughs> I love it. So there's a few things. First is that the entire panel that the viewers have just seen um, originally had um, organic and mineral matter over it. So you looked at the white material, that was all what was um, the residual of taking off other material. And then with the code of the cave artist did is he put um, black and red discs and he also um, engraved out lines. So the difference is that um, the, the artist created a, a relief on this cave wall, okay? But then the question we need to ask is, well, why didn't people see this for the last 100 years? Why did the ancient Greeks see this? How could the, how the cave artist see this or even create this? That's a really important question. And it draws to the, to the issue of, that we all see the world differently. Some people, for example, when they have a stroke, they lose the, the ability to see faces in the clouds. Okay. 
Okay. And some people lose the ability to recognize their own children and spouse and spouse. Okay. And that's a basic brain function. Well, there's a spectrum of what people can see, whether someone sees you know, a face in the cloud or they see a zoo in the clouds. Okay. And psychologists do a test called an embedded figures test. If you remember the children's menu at the diner on the flip side, you had to find the animals. That's an embedded figures test. And some people will either jump right in to find the animals or they'll work on the math and crossword puzzles on the outside. Okay. If you're in a math crossword puzzle, you person, you are on the different end of the spectrum than the person who jumped right into the animals. So there's differences between us. People who are very good at finding those animals go in towards the career of graphic arts and arts in general. Now, the, the person who's very good on the math side will focus on engineering and STEM type of programs. So what is the difference, be, what is the difference between Pergolia, being able to see faces in the clouds, and this is, and these images, it's a way that we see the world as individuals, how we project ourselves, how we project what's in our mind. A very important concept. So I believe that at a distant point in the past, in the Paleolithic, there were certain people who had a very high ability to do embedded image tests. And they were probably low on the math side, because that's the other end of the spectrum. And they became the great artists, in the same way Da Vinci and Michelangelo became great artists. David in marble was seen before it was sculpted out. You have to see the image in your mind first. You have to see the, then project that image into the rock. You have to see the nuances in the marble to then find David. And that's very similar to this. Now we can say that if there are people with these abilities, it's probably fairly rare. Because if we can go back the last few hundred years, we find very few people at a very high level, at the super high level. And going back tens of thousands of years, we find people who are extraordinarily competent at this or, you know, genius at this. Now, archaeologists and anthropologists who work in these caves have gone back and looked at the images and compared them because they were the pictures that they took that I use. And they looked at the cave, the cave art, and they said, yes, this is what it is. And they're struggling within themselves. But what is the direction that they now take in archaeology and anthropology now that we have a different direction of travel. Prior to my work in archaeology and anthropology of the Paleolithic and cave art, there is all over the board what the concepts were. It was shamanism, it was art, um, light deprivation, it was um, art for earth, art's sake, it was hunting magic. No one really had a sense of this whole thing. And the reason they didn't have a sense of it is because they didn't connect the dots. They weren't able to see the images and form a common story. But now that we find a common story, we find the story of the hero on his journey. The same story that Joseph Campbell spoke about, the same story that we project into Star Wars via George Lucas, and the same story that's in our imagination as forwarded by Carl Jung. Wow, see? You have, to, you have to get the book now, because there's all the images in there are really cool. In fact, in, in the book I got was more nice and glossy, so seeing seeming those pictures are so much nicer, the hand and holding your hand. Uh, I wish we were doing Dragon Con not virtual, because then people can actually go and pick up the book. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Dragon Con virtual. Um, hopefully, uh, I can convince you to come to DragonCon in person next year when we actually can do it in person and you can come and hang out with a hundred and something thousand people who come and come in all the costumes of the, the legends and the heroes you just talked about. Thank you, Bernie, and uh, I'm going to go off to the next presentation. As fun as all this streaming content is, we sincerely cannot wait to see you all in person again next year. Remember to stay healthy and safe until then. Wear a mask when interacting with other people out in the real world. Want more Skip Track? Get more than 10 years of Skeptics Track programming at our video archive video.skeptrack.org